to give this talk. Um, as I said, uh, when I made the uh, abstract, I was probably thinking of everything that photonic ICs have done over the past few years, uh, not thinking about the fact that I was being asked to talk about them. Uh, so today I'll try to summarize some of the developments. And indeed it's been a uh, very exciting time in the last year or so because things are maturing in a number of fields and uh, today we find ourselves with a lot of options in photonic ICs and really a lot of opportunities are coming together. In fact, we're finding that uh, PICs and different technologies are even being put into the same systems with uh, heterogeneous integration. So I'll try to probably uh, finish my talk with that, uh, with that kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, needless to say, I've had a little help in this talk uh, with some contributions from a number of friends. In fact, I had more friends send me slides and uh, I managed to get it down to only like an hour and a half talk. But uh, I will try to uh, see if I can get it into 45 minutes today. So what's the problem we're trying to solve with photonic ICs? I think it's obvious we're trying to get to smaller size, weight, and power. But we're trying to do that with at least as good performance and reliability. Uh, and where are we trying to do this? Well, of course, in communication, sensing, instrumentation, and computing. And this has been happening for a number of years. Integration platforms, probably, I guess, when I entered the world of uh, integration, it was indium phosphide. And as you'll see in a minute, uh, things happened even before that. With indium phosphide, of course, we have excellent active components. Boundaries really aren't here yet, but they're evolving. I will not talk about the passive silica on silicon technologies. I'll stick with semiconductors today. So I also will not talk about polymers. Uh, Silicon photonics in the past decade really has come on very strong, but the main pitch I think is piggybacking on the silicon electronics industry uh, and probably the main holdback there is the no laser and no active components. And so we're seeing a lot of hybrid solutions uh, pulling some of the actives uh, together with the silicon and uh, as I said earlier the heterogeneous uh, platforms that pull a little bit from both uh, uh, maybe indium phosphide chips, silicon chips and maybe even some other kinds of technologies in the same in the same package. So this is a slide that I will not go through in great detail, but just to indicate, back in the 70s, there were OEICs. When I say OEICs, this is electronics with photonics on the same chip. Uh, we still have that going on, but uh, this was maybe a transistor or two with a de detector uh, or a laser or a modulator on gallium arsenide. Uh, uh, mainly aimed at high-speed computing, but also some communications work. Uh, in the 80s, we got to indium phosphide because of fibers. There was a little bit of work on coherent to extend reach. Widely tunables in the 90s, a little bit of WDM coming in. In fact, a lot of WDM because of the erbium fiber, dense WDM. Vixels came in for datacom sort of competed a little bit with uh, a lot of the uh, small-scale photonic ICs. Uh, of course, 2000, we all know about the explosion of strange ideas that uh, actually helped in many ways develop uh, things at the expense of the venture capitalists. Uh, dense WDM actually somewhat extinguished 
the uh, explosion of ideas and satisfy the, de the demand for bandwidth during that time. But it, it turns out uh, this bandwidth demand uh, that uh, people predicted because of the explosion of data, which overcame voice around 2000, is now needed again. Uh, and it's been needed since 2010. In the 2000, we saw Indian phosphide picks uh, mature. Of course, we saw more use of pixels. We saw more high-speed datacom and telecom. Around the mid-2000s, silicon photonics really emerged and started uh, being worked on really with a number of goals. Some people said we can do the electronics and the photonics together. Uh, again, much like back in the 70s with gallium arsenide, and uh, others said, well, we have these, uh, this great line control, we can do such high performance uh, picks this way. Others in the electronics world actually said, well, wait a minute, uh, we have a problem with Moore's law now, maybe we can use optical interconnection. So a lot of different research going on in silicon starting at I, I don't know, mid-2000s. Uh, around 2008, we realized uh, coherent had to be used again, but this time for spectral efficiency, not for reach. And advanced modulation formats, coherent receivers. We really need photonic integration to do that right. We need the stability and uh, the closeness of components for that. Uh, uh, the last few years, everything's beginning to mature. And uh, of course, pixels are getting better, and that's competing at the short end. And this heterogeneous integration, uh, multi-chip, uh, chip-on-chip, 3D integration. And today, uh, we could say we have a quandary about which way to go, or could, we could say we have a wealth of opportunities. So, of course, communication, we have all of this network. Uh, at, the, at the access end, people talk a lot about wireless and think that everything's wireless. I keep telling my neighbor, well, you know, it's really not all wireless in the, in the network. It's pretty much all fiber. Uh, we have data centers that are exploding. All of this is, of course, uh, demanding more fiber, demanding more bandwidth, uh, and power is a big deal. And uh, new applications and sensors are coming about. These are lots. Uh, largely coherent in nature, looking for very uh, high sensitivity or selectivity that coherent gives us. Uh, and some of these applications are again looking to solve uh, intimate interconnect issues on the chip or between chips. Uh, so again, this was a motivator for silicon photonics, as I mentioned. But, you know, pixels are still in there, especially for the chip-to-chip -chip interconnects. Not going to talk much about pixels other than throwing it in occasionally, because it's still a, a competitor that somewhat slows down some of the photonic integration. This is an older slide that I got from Peter Windsor a few years ago, but it makes the point that around 2000 is where Datacom took over from Telecom in terms of the the fiber network and the, the, uh, the demand for bandwidth. And of course, it's interesting to see that supercomputers and now really data centers more and more are, are growing exponentially. And we see this demand and we can see all of these familiar symbols here that we all have used and this continues to give us exponential growth uh, for bandwidth uh, and a lot of our toys today that we carry around in our pockets are causing this, as well as cloud computing and, uh, and so forth. So what about the supply? Well, I, I already mentioned that around 2000, the demand went up. I might as well throw that up there, uh, the network demand. But you notice the, the steepness of this curve is more than the supply these days, which uh, is uh, after the explosion of dense WDM, which really uh, satisfied the demand back in the early 2000s. We're now using coherent to satisfy the demand recently, but uh, we're running out of steam again in the fiber network uh, 
we have to lay new fiber or do something. And of course, space division multiplexing is one of the recent uh, uh, things that we're looking at. But uh, even that uh, is, is uh, you know, hero experiments that we had recently. We're still going to have to lay more fiber. Maybe we should lay more fiber with lots of cores. Is the is the recent discussion, but. Uh, all of this calls for much more complex transmitters and receivers. That's, that's really what we're coming around full circle to conclude. So the motivation, again, for photonic integration, not only does it have to be small, light, and reduced, have reduced power to squeeze into a small box, it has to be cheap. And anybody out there in business knows that your, your customers want you to do more and more and more for the same cost. But what's interesting is oftentimes you get better performance. Yes, there's a compromise in performance on the chip because you have to use the same design rules, but you get better performance overall because you don't have all those coupling losses, you don't have problems with stability and so forth. And reliability tends to be better. People used to think, well, I just have to look at each, you know, multiplied the number of parts, uh, or the reliability of each part to the nth power. But it, the reliability is oftentimes dictated by the packaging and the uh, alignment of things and the facet coatings and things like that. We've seen vast increases in reliability uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, maybe a little reduction in chip yield. After all, there are, might be a couple hundred components on there but not the kind of reductions one might assume. Uh, and I have two slides on this, and the other is from Chris Dorr. That was from Fred Keish and people at Infinera. A little bit of a silicon angle here. A uh, uh, point that we didn't mention there was putting electronics close to photonics allows you to get around this 50 ohm termination. Really, really important. Uh, so that we can get, uh, you know, higher impedance uh, around that, you know, if you thought about electronics, if you had to have 50 ohm terminations between uh, resistors or between gates in your cell phone, you would have something that would explode instantly. And that's the only way you can make uh, big uh, ICs without having uh, terminations of this low impedance. Uh, you only have one cooler now. If you need a cooler, at least it's only one or a couple hundred elements. Uh, performance, yeah, you can't optimize your components exactly. You have to have some trade-offs because common design rules, but again, only one input-output coupling. You can avoid isolators. And, you know, most people thought that, geez, you know, how can you get isolators on the chip? But when you're going in and out of the same waveguide, you can play little tricks. This was a learning exercise for about 15 years, learning how to angle interfaces, learn how to not change the impedance so much as you go in and out of devices, but we've managed to learn how to live without isolators by and large. And another really important point, interference <coughs> and feedback are stable and small. And think of a Mach Zender modulator and just stringing fibers together. How, how good would that work? Versus the in, good old integrated mock sender modulator from the 1970s. Uh, we, we have been doing integration longer than you think, if you stop and think about it. Relying upon the phase being stable over hundreds of wavelengths, actually, uh, getting down to a small fraction of a wavelength and stability. Uh, low price. Well, it should be lower price because price is normally de determined by the package and the packaging. It's not, the, not really the chip price. So uh, that's, these are all really important motivators. Uh, so let's go back and look at a little bit of history of uh, uh, indium phosphide. I'll start with this first. Uh, Back in the early 80s is where we really got into this and work of uh, Suimatsu's group at Tech Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, 
did some outstanding work. Uh, this is maybe more complicated than it has to be, but really developed ways of making active passive interfaces, partially transmissive mirrors, uh, DBR, vertical coupler, this had everything in this device. Uh, we also made some devices that lived on forever. This is the old EML, first developed in the 80s, a laser connected to an electric absorption modulator. Again, probably the longest living uh, photonic IC, if you want to call this a photonic IC that there is. Uh, coherent communication, as I mentioned, was, was intensively investigated in the 80s because we didn't have erbium amplifiers. We wanted to do WDM. It wasn't dense, but every 30 or 40 kilometers, we had to s stop, go into the electronics world, demultiplex, and amplify, and then remodulate blah, 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 it was expensive, it was terrible. So if we could use coherent, we could double the distance. I only use 10 photons per bit, something like that. So we worked on integration. This is an outstanding example from Tom Koch and Uzi Corin, where they have an entire coherent receiver on a chip. This is the kinds of things that we're doing today. Probably doing a little bit better than this, but uh, uh, this was an outstanding early example. Tunable laser, coupler, balanced pair of detectors. But uh, as I said, uh, what happened, of course, was EDFA come along, and we got better, also better WDM filters, and we moved through the 90s pretty much with, uh, uh, without coherent uh, uh, receivers and without advanced modulation techniques. So, but what, what we did get out of that was, um, when we got to WDM and even out of the coherent area, was a need for widely tunable lasers, lasers that could tune over the full bandwidth. There was a whole bunch of work going on. This happens to be work that I was involved in. This shows a widely tunable laser. Here on the right side, an amplifier outside of the cavity, and then a mock sender modulator. This could tune across the whole C-band, deliver lots of power, as it turned out. And it, the biggest point, I think, that lives, lived on for a while was once you could do gratings, uh, phase sections, gain sections, amplifiers, and modulators all on the same chip, Gee, I guess I could keep going, you know, and do other things. Splitter, I had splitters here for the Mach and This is a ship we did in the early 2000s. You know, we had splitters and phase shifters and all the good things. And of course, JDSU has been doing this now for about the past decade with roughly this same platform. A little bit of tweaks here and there that they won't tell you about. Lots of tweaks, to be honest. And, you know, now smaller, lower power, higher performance, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not the only ones. There have been lots of other versions of these widely tunable lasers, some of them selectable arrays. And guess what? The widely deployed commercial WDM picks 2008, a number of years later. These widely tunables were made in the 90s, most of them. Uh, this one lives on. This was made in the 80s. Uh, so uh, that's where this technology has evolved to. And the PICs, though, have gotten much more complex. Infinera has had this as their charter from the beginning, taking really that EML concept and here putting 10 of them in, a, in parallel and for the first time really putting the AWG multiplexer together with that, making a little more sophisticated chain than just the EML with the detector in the back and a <clears throat> power monitor, or uh, I should say adjuster in the front, and then a, a matched receiver on a chip and also putting all the silicon drivers or detectors in the same package at the same time. So from the mid-2000s, this has evolved 
and it had to go coherent along the way because, as you recall, we ran out of bandwidth around about 2006 or 7, and everybody wanted to go coherent, and this basically wound up pretty much universally in a polarization multiplexed uh, QPSK format where we could get now four bits per symbol, maybe at best four bits per hertz if you didn't have too many guard band uh, uh, bandwidth. Uh, and this shows the evolution at Infinera, 2011 getting to 500 gigabits uh, in a single fiber out of their array, now using mock senders, now using again both TE and TM, uh, and then more recently getting to a super channel, so getting rid of those guard bands, and uh, I, I, I didn't verify this, but their claim is that they're grabbing a good piece of the, of the long haul market uh, in the last number of years here, or at least a window of time that this uh, slide represents. And roadmap showing that uh, recently uh, being able to get a couple of terabytes down a single fiber, again using this single chip at the transmitter single chip at the receiver. Well, these coherent approaches and the receiver have used this approach of so-called intradyne, where the incoming signal first of all goes through a, really a polarization splitter, then into an optical hybrid, and finally into uh, the, uh, the back end, which ends up at a DSP. And using this approach, which is particularly important for long haul, uh, the chromatic dispersion, polarization demultiplexing, and the polarization mode dispersion, other linear, nonlinear uh, dispersion uh, impairments can be removed. But we've looked at this actually at UCSB and interest has been many times for sensors, instrumentation, perhaps sure to reach ships and airplanes, things like that, where you wanted to get a lot of bandwidth or you wanted to just use coherent or its uh, sensitivity or selectivity being able to dial in. So we've gone back and looked at uh, simple homodyne as we did in the 80s, but now using a Costas loop and a widely tunable LO on a single chip and really not using the digital back end. And what you gain is the elimination of a lot of power dissipation and really also a lot of elimination of a very expensive design cycle if you're only going to sell a few thousand of these a year. Uh, and, of course, this now requires very short feedback loops to be able to uh, get both frequency and phase locking without uh, having a grad student there turning knobs to keep this thing working. And so we've done that. It sort of looks like this. Well, that exactly looks like this, as a matter of fact. And here's a pick. This includes the widely tunable local oscillator, the hybrid, the four photodiodes to give you the IQ and IQ primed. A special kind of IC, this is a Costas loop design with, with some, a digital design, but it, it's a phase frequency detector and a loop filter feeding back to the local oscillator to provide not only frequency locking, but phase locking. Uh, it's about a centimeter. These are all the claims that uh, we made. This was a student talk. I would never make you know, claims for such superlatives for our work, but the student did. Uh, this did not have to be very carefully temperature controlled, but it worked up to 40 gigabits per second. It was a square centimeter in size. This actually used three watts and that was because it was all indium phosphide 
uh, electronics. It could have been uh, done actually in SIGI. Uh, it would have been about one watt in that case. But this is everything. You only need a fiber and power supply to make this work. 10 to the minus 12, air free, no effect required. And it also goes up to about 50 kilometers at 10 gigabits per second. So this was actually BPSK. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't have done QPSK with a slightly different uh, IC chip. So, very interesting. We can't get rid of impairments, of course. So you have to work within the chromatic dispersion limit. So this is only good for short distances at, at low data rates. Uh, and this is versus this approach. So something to think about for short distance, maybe in data centers even. Uh, relatively inexpensive to make. This is what the pick looks like. So we're talking about picks. There's a widely tunable laser, 93 hybrid, four photo detectors. All these devices work pretty well. So those are one example. This is looks like the same circuit, but this is a heterodyne for frequency synthesis. Now we put an RF signal in a mixer in the electronic circuit. Excuse me. Didn't want to go. I forget how to go backwards in this now. It's that way. So this allows us to tune off to the side, not just to homodyne, and generate any frequency we want. And unlike in the quantum world, we actually can almost clone the signal coming and clone the phase at least, so we can get the same line width. And I should have said that before. The, uh, when we phase lock, we're basically cloning the carrier on the incoming signal. So we get the same line width and uh, the same phase noise properties of the carrier on the signal. And this just shows, uh, uh, I didn't show that yet, there's very low phase noise now on the tunable local oscillator. This has about a 500 megahertz loop bandwidth. We had a gigahertz before. This will automatically capture and lock from 25 gigahertz away. And this shows 160 gigahertz. This is a comb now coming in to the, uh, to the chip. And this shows either 70 minus or 90 plus. This is a wavelength scale, so 90 plus is going this way. Uh, this is the original comb, and 70 minus is going this way. It's a 40 gigahertz comb. Uh, this just shows the, with 10 gigahertz offset, you can see it locking up. The white lines become sharper. This is the phase noise. This is the RF synthesizer, so we're pretty much following the phase noise of the synthesizer, a little bit of lab vibration. So this works. The third thing we looked at was reducing the line width of a rather noisy, widely tunable laser by just putting a lot of feedback on a locking crystal. The locking crystal was actually integrated on with a tunable laser, just one chip and a lot of feedback. That's all it is. So that fits in a very small package, one crystal, Free spectral range of 10 gigahertz. So every 10 gigahertz, you can lock it up, tune over 40 nanometers, and reduce the normally terrible line width of 5 megahertz down to about 150 kilohertz. Just put a lot of gain on the locking crystal, and you can get a nice line width every 10 gigahertz across the whole spectrum. So as Chris Doerr has told us. There's a metro challenge. We saw Infinero was integrating a lot of stuff out here. I didn't tell you, but there's a lot of silicon photonics, active optical cables, and so forth down here. There's also uh, uh, work with pixel arrays and so forth down here that are closely being integrated even on the boards now, right beside the uh, computer chips with the heterogeneous integration techniques uh, at a couple of different companies. But down here it's price, up here it's performance. Uh, what about in the middle? And Chris's, his company Acacia has been working on that. There's been some studies saying 
he really ought to be working on metro rather than long haul. After all, that's where the money's going to be in the next few years. Uh, Cisco says that, Bell Labs says that, the LIF studies have all said that. Most of the information is going to stay in the metro loops. It's not going to be going across the country. Well, there's, it's not going to, there's not going to be less information going across the country. It's just going to be more in the metro loops. Uh, and all this says is the sweet spot is really probably still PM QPSK. Uh, probably not worth getting the signal to noise that good to use QAM, and besides, you can't use limiting amplifiers, and, uh, and we're sort of wasting our time if we only use BPSK. Uh, Chris also makes the point that it's good to in integrate all the electro optics on one chip and all the ASIC on one ASIC. That is, both the transmitter and receiver, and drivers and receivers, as well as the DSP. In fact, make that one big fat ASIC. This is, of course, assuming there's going to be a big market. Otherwise, you wouldn't spend the 30, 40 million dollars it's going to take to make this. Uh, and for the first time, we have a real, now, arm wrestling match here is, should we do this photonic chip in indium phosphide, which strangely to most people, at least a couple of years ago, is the legacy material, and silicon is a new kid on the block. Uh, that's sort of changing, they're almost now, you know, evenly paired in terms of the, the capabilities. Well, indium phosphide is expensive, silicon's cheap. Uh, of course, I'm the indium phosphide guy, I'm sorry. I haven't figured that out. Uh, <laughs> of course, that, the chip expenses usually doesn't matter. And when you look at the actual package, it's, uh, it's once you put it together, you don't even notice the chip expense, but that's okay. Uh, indium is scarce, but nobody's noticed that yet either. <laughs> uh, medium yield, they're small, that's true, and they're fragile. That, I would certainly say that. High yield, it's big, that's why it's high yield. Somebody commented the other day, but you couldn't use all the chips you made on a 12-inch wafer. There's not enough market for that. But the answer to that is you can have a different mass design for every little square on the 12-inch silicon wafer. You don't have to do you know, a thousand of the same things on the 12-inch wafer, or even big, you do 10,000, of course, if they're not so big. Small footprint, uh, and high index contrast in 1D. I did, and, and, and here, extremely small, you can make very small waveguides. The downside of that is you have to couple into them. Uh, up here, uh, you get good vertical control. I should have made that point with indium phosphide. The epitaxy gives you very good vertical control. In the silicon, you get good lateral control. Actually, not so good vertical control in silicon. And the epitaxy material is actually better than the substrate here. Here, it's the other way around. And efficient laser photodiode, uh, not the same over here. Good dark current, bad dark current. Doesn't matter in coherent. So who cares if you have bad, bad dark current if you're doing coherent? Uh, small wafers, large wafers. Temperature sensitive modulators, yes. Temperature insensitive because you're using depletion. But you can also do depletion over here. I actually did that for a few years. And yes, they're temperature insensitive, but less efficient. So, silicon photonics allows you to make big chips and uh, put lots of stuff on them and everything works as long as you keep the laser off chip. Polarizing beam splitters work very nice because people have worked diligently to do surface coupling into gratings, two-dimensional gratings, to split the polarization. You don't have to do that here with the laser, of course. Uh, and I think that just says that if you have one chip, it's already assembled. Uh, 
just to repeat what I've said in words, uh, receivers have been made in silicon. I think we know that they've been made in indium phosphide. A couple of example, examples here. Um, uh, different companies, uh, Chris oh, was still at Bell Labs. Uh, modulators, nested modulators, and a uh, different kind of MOS modulator here reported over the past couple of years. Uh, different technology uh, that actually combines the three fives with silicon photonics, uh, calling John Bowers' group at uh, California Santa Barbara, actually wafer bonds chips on the silicon and then etches off the substrate leaving just a micron or two of the 3,5 compound, which now can handle thermal expansion and so forth. And then he patterns it. So there wasn't any critical placement to start with. The patterning is done uh, with a silicon patterning process. So lots of different devices have been made successfully. Uh, lasers, big rings, DBRs, DFBs, modulators, EAs, and not just made, but made with good performance, uh, photo detectors, amplifiers, small ring lasers, uh, pretty, pretty nice performance on the uh, EA modulators, reasonably good femtojoules per bit just for the modulator itself, and uh, distributed feedback laser arrays over the whole surface. Uh, Good thresholds, not the greatest differential efficiency perhaps, but they were going for looking at yields and getting the thresholds down. Uh, Spin-out company Orion has done uh, quite an array of different uh, devices uh, to make, you might say, a full spectrum of products focusing uh, mainly on the 13th 1310, but also looking at telecom lasers, uh, again, making modulators uh, and uh, photo detectors. Note that the 1310 is uh, athermal, making use of the silicon uh, properties uh, together with the indium phosphide and maybe some thin films, but they're not talking about it. Uh, Oracle has summarizes here for us uh, some of the different kinds of uh, components that have been made by a couple of different companies, but they have almost a complete uh, suite here of different devices, waveguides, modulators, ring resonators uh, with the mock senders. The rings have been very popular with a number of companies, mainly because of their smallness, possibility of being compatible with silicon electronics. There's generally an incompatibility between the photonics and the electronics, because photonics tend to be big, electronics tend to be small. You don't typically want to leave big spaces in the CMOS to put in the electronics, and the design rules are a little bit different. So this sort of leads to maybe doing something like shown here, using a chip that is micro-bumped uh, the three fives to the CMOS and com having half the cavity in the silicon, half the cavity, the gain part in the three five, but having really separate chips, more the heterogeneous integration concept. Uh, they've, like I said, another, a couple of other companies have worked hard on the ring resonators for modulators also for muxes and demuxes. Uh, they have to be temperature controlled to get them at the right wavelength. And they've shown that you can, of course, etch off the substrate at the back and that gives you lower thermal impedance so that it takes lower power. You still need some sort of feedback loop to adjust the wavelength. And uh, the flip chip photonics that I mentioned is not just being done by them, but a uh, number of examples here. Uh, this is the pixels with imaging arrays. And LuxTerra is notable because their initial, I think, pitch uh, 
was to combine the electronics and the photonics monolithically on the same silicon. And recently, they're doing more of the hybrid or heterogeneous integration with the electronics and the photonics on separate chips, separately optimized and bumped or heterogeneously integrated. Uh, just a summary again from Oracle of work they've done with Kotora, Luxterra, uh, and uh, so forth of this 3D integration. They're calling it hybrid, which is a little confusing because Bowers and uh, calls his wafer bonding also hybrid. Uh, a lot of people call this heterogeneous. Uh, and they've done some work in uh, theoretical as well as uh, experimental, and it can even at some point claim that the hybrid or heterogeneous can outperform the monolithic. As the monolithics, you're sort of out here to the side and you have to wire sideways, but with the uh, heterogeneous, you can be up above. And also the time to market is a good point. You only have to redesign one of the chips and as long as you keep the same bonding pads. And they're, they're getting down the bonding pads like 20 microns now, so you're not really dealing with a lot of capacitance there, so that uh, this can actually be higher performance as well as more flexible and perhaps more economical to do the flip chip or the heterogeneous integration. And this is not just a few companies saying this. This is from the ECOC last fall. Uh, this is from Leti. Uh, again, due to the differences in node sizes between opto and electronics, 3D CMOS integration. And the point is, electronics folks have developed this 3D integration. They have the tools. They've developed this micro bumping. And this is an example of a 50 micron period. Uh, to do this, and we can take advantage of this sometimes called system in a package, where you bump a bunch of stuff on top of an interposer, and this is out of this month's Chip Scale Review magazine, where they show this active interposer with a bunch of chiplets, I.O., maybe a processor, maybe memory, uh, maybe MEMS, stick a bunch of chiplets on top of an interposer. This supplies power. It might be a flexible interconnect uh, network. Uh, and this concept is, is being used a lot, the so-called packaging of chips, but very flexible, maybe lower cost to go from one generation. You can get a fancier processor, stick it onto the old technology, perhaps. So what are the takeaways here? Well, the obvious one, lower size, weight, and power, cost. Maybe the C should come first. Uh, picks are important because of the inherently stable phase relationship. This one is not always the one that first comes to mind. And the seamless interfaces between elements. Uh, this is probably number one in my mind. I make picks, this is what I think about, because you can make things you can't make otherwise because of bullet number two. Picks generally bring better reliability once they're properly designed. Maybe the yield and some aspects of performance are compromised. So you should think better reliability, not worse. Picks integrated with electronic ICs, which are probably the way to go, maybe heterogeneously integrated, are needed to reduce the transmission line parasitics. Shouldn't have your electronics over here and the photonics over here. They need to be close together. Get rid of 50 ohms. And you want to control them. Maybe you want to make a mock sender that has 10 or 20 electrodes on it so you don't have to make really a traveling wave mock center. You put the phase delay in the electronics. And uh, feedback. Many things you can make these days. You take a nonlinear, crazy analog device and you put some feedback in there and make a near-perfect 
device out of it, but you need instantaneous feedback. Single crystal integration may not be as desirable as heterogeneous, and Oracle had a slide on that, unless high volume. It could be the cheap and dirty high volume stuff that is monolithic, where you really do want to run out a million a month. You don't want to mess with packaging. On the other hand, the packaging is getting so sophisticated that perhaps that, that still works. And like I said right here, you know, might want to use the silicon technology that's being developed even as we talk here today to put a system in a package, get rid of all those leads coming out of the package and do most of the interconnects inside the package. Thank you very much.